What's up, everybody? This is Sunday, March too much, 8th, and too we. Much. What's up? Oh my god. How y'all doing? This is Sunday, March 8th. Um, do you want to roll with that or do you want me to edit that out? That was so bad. Say, what's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? No, <laughs> not saying that. What do you want me to say? Yo, 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 what's up? I'm starting to realize it's important that Karch is a part of this podcast. <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Sunday, March 8th, and we are Never Free to Play, a podcast where we talk all about the video games we wish we were playing. I'm one of your hosts, Jason Wright, joined by the worst one himself, Greg Artelona. How y'all doing? For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, you are in for a special episode. Usually my friend Karch and I are hosting, but we put Karch on probation for saying mean things about The Last of Us, so we're recording next week's episode a little early, and we have Greg here as our guest host. Now, before we dive in, please find us over at NeverFreeToPlay.com, Patreon.com slash NeverFreeToPlay, or on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitch, where we are at NeverFreeToPlay. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, feedback, please send it to us at NeverFreeToPlay at gmail.com. Okay, that's enough of that. Greg, tell me, how you been doing, man? Doing good, man. Excited to uh, be a part of the other end of the podcast, not just the mixing this week. So we're excited to, to have you on. You are our first guest host ever. Episode the, three is a good three. time to start your guest host. <laughs> <laughs> it's already falling apart. The wheels are coming off. Cards is ditching us. What are you going to do? Well, 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 well. I got to say, incredibly nervous to be on this side of the microphone, but I have some hopefully interesting things to say so i'm excited to jump into it all right let's get into it man let's start with corrections um cue corrections music right here beep boop beep boop beep boop boop i I think we had a pretty good week last week um we are fortunate enough to not have uh, listeners so if i tell (laughs) you the wrong thing it won't matter um the only thing i think we got wrong last week because we're kind of self-correcting now is we were talking about um gamecube and we thought it had come out first when we were talking about the best consoles ever but we were actually wrong uh gamecube actually came out a year after ps2 so that is what we got wrong last week as far as we know as far as we know but you can write in and tell us uh if we were wrong i'll leave that up to you guys all right let's get into some news uh not a whole lot to talk about this week but actually maybe more than we have the past few weeks um but we can kind of go through it quickly uh, so the first thing we have is Ghost of Tsushima has a release date. It's actually a little sooner than I anticipated. It's coming out June 26th. Did you 20- see the trailer, Greg? I have seen the uh, original, I think it was like the E3 season trailer. Got me pretty excited about it. Um, I was a huge fan of Infamous 3, the third Infamous. I actually didn't play the first two. Um, but this game totally different direction for them i'm pretty excited to see it seems like a little bit of dark souls elements in there from what i could tell a little bit more methodical combat than just the uh hack and slashness of uh infamous i'm kind of excited about that yeah no i'm really excited i mean the last time sucker punch sucker punch is the studio uh that's developing this game they haven't put a game out since infamous second son and then the extent the expanded dlc uh, first light but that was a launch game for PS4 back in 2014. So it's been six years since the studio put anything out. So um, it kind of makes sense though, right? So they had uh, the three infamous games was 2009, 2011, and 2014. So, I mean, when you're building on something in IP, you already had kind of built up there. It makes sense, right? To, to be turning them out. But a six-year gap from the between games for a, for a brand new something, um, hopefully that just means... It wasn't six years of them being indecisive and restarting and having trouble. Hopefully that's six years of them them really working through this. Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard any impressions. I'm not sure if they have any sort of playable demo out there or if they were going to have anything at these upcoming shows that have been canceled. But, I mean, from just judging off the trailer, it looks really good. And it's kind of fitting that they put out one of the first, if not the first, 
uh, PS4 exclusive, then missed the whole generation, but they're putting out like the sunset exclusive to polish off this, this gen. So I think it's really fitting and I am definitely looking forward to it. Yeah. You know, thinking back on infamous now though, at the time, you know, launch PS4 and kind of what we expected out of games. I thought infamous was like, Oh my God, especially because I barely played any PS3 games. That was kind of a lull for me. Yeah. Same. But looking back at it now, I don't know. Like if infamous came out this year, I, don't think that's like a nine out of ten game. No, I I am I'm with you there a lot. There was missing a lot. I mean, I think what it did well, it did well if that makes sense. I think the combat was really fun, um, but the Lloyd, world it was cool. very empty. The world itself was very empty. I remember like wishing for more because even at that time, I think GTA Five had come out on the PS3. And in terms of like how lively that world felt, I just felt like, yeah, Second Son was very lacking in that regard. Yeah. And, and the question there is, right, it was this because this was had been worked on through the PS3 generation and it was a launch title for PS4 and they didn't know, you know, what they could do or get away with. Or is that was the constraint the studio and the resources the studio had? So it'll be really interesting to see if if how much they can step it up. And does this game uh feel like a true big triple a you know playstation title like some of the ones we've seen um or is this gonna be you know is this okay is this the last of us or is this days gone right is right. this sony's triple a front runner leader the last of us marquee title or is this like oh yeah that other zombie game yeah well i guess we'll just have to see i mean um, I think PlayStation is giving them the time that they need. So hopefully, hopefully that it results in a good product. So we will see, but, um, that's enough of that. We can move on to the next news item, which is speaking of the last of us, there is a series in the works at HBO. So HBO is working on this in concert with PlayStation productions, and they actually have the creator and writer of Chernobyl, Craig Mazin, and also Neil Druckmann working on this. So there's no word on release date yet, but I am super interested. Uh, okay. Just like all video game movies and TV shows, I will get excited about this when it actually exists. <laughs> I mean, and that's totally fair because it's interesting. The other things that I know of that PlayStation Productions is working on, uh, interestingly enough, that same Chernobyl creator is writing the script for a Borderlands movie uh, where they also have. <laughs> yeah, that should be interesting. So that I, it's kind of strange. And then the other thing is that cursed Uncharted movie that seems like it's been in production hell for like however many years i mean like five or six years now how so. about that like a world of warcraft movie right that was in production forever yeah. and canceled 17 times and then came out and everyone was like eh, eh, okay right no yeah i think i think hopefully this stuff will be a little bit on better footing than that and i think also since tv has been in this renaissance and you've seen success with ip like the witcher being successfully converted into a tv well, show that's a good point because that very well may be the most successful video game to tv conversion that i can think of of other than of course the great mario live action oh my gosh <laughs> i i i think it's because we were kids and i didn't know any better but i have a special place in my heart for that movie i love um, that movie you have to watch it now that you aren't like 12 anymore because it is the weirdest thing you will ever see when is the last time you watched it I watched a YouTube documentary on the making of. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. We, we, you watched that with me? Like, why do we both see this? I think we watched it together. So any, anybody who wants to go check this thing out, it's a gaming, is a gaming historian? I, I think gaming, it is. Gaming history. Uh, oh God. Let's see. Hold on, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. So, so while he's looking that up, I mean, they deep dive into like the multiple directors that went through this, the like, safety issues they had on set like how everything was just like haphazardly thrown together it went through like multiple different rewrites and then at the end of it they just kind of spat out whatever they could throw together and was like yep this is what mario's legacy should be in terms of the big screen oh my gosh yeah it, it was such a great little mini documentary it's about 30 minutes long and the youtube channel is gaming historian 
go check that out for anybody who has any passing interest at a crappy 90s Mario movie that was like too gritty for its own good. Go <laughs> check that out. Because what the world needed was a gritty live action Mario movie, right? Yeah. And that's just such the interesting thing is that I don't think that was really Nintendo's vision at all, but they very much wanted to cash in on the success of that IP. And it just, just went off the rails. What are you like? Yeah. Like what, like family friendly Nintendo, like, like that is not what you expect them to do. Like they had to have signed it off, like gotten paid for it and just been like, okay, we will uh, just do whatever you want with Mario, our most right. valuable IP. Like that is, you cannot fathom that happening today. I, yeah, and I don't know if part of it's like they just underestimated how popular it was and they just didn't really understand. And I know that they were kind of on a budget in terms of production too. So it's not like they went out there and got like the best director they could find and all that. So the, the documentary covers that. Everybody should go check it out. Absolutely. So, but, but while we're still on this Last of Us TV show thing here, okay, it's HBO. We know that they can make some good gritty television which is what the last of us needs to be if it's going to be good but but my concern is and you know i understand this is this is what got karch put in time out here but you know i'm gonna have to say something that that you know is going against the last of us here i think the last of us is one of the greatest video games of all time i think it is the greatest story ever told through a video game but with that said I'm pretty sure the last of us story is like a C list daytime television equivalent for TV. I don't know that it really holds up. You know what, Greg, you can go to South Carolina with Karch and and you can enjoy that vacation with he and his wife, Rachel for their anniversary. And, and I will do this podcast by myself. Yeah. You know, you might have to, because you're on an Island here. I can't say that I totally disagree with you in the, in terms of it. It's a little bit, trite it's a little bit overdone it's it's it's, the tro- the, it's, it's the, all it's the same tropes of every single zombie movie yeah yeah like there's nothing really, special there other than the characters and how well, they're written no and i think what really sucks you into it is when you're playing as these characters and you feel a part of the story like it feels bigger it feels more important but the story itself and the elements right like there was nothing groundbreaking about that story it was just well done combined with great gameplay combined with it's a video game and right and it was right at the playstation 3 turned to the playstation 4 where we were we were really getting the most out of the playstation 3 and the, you know obviously had the power behind the playstation 4 like it was a groundbreaking game i just don't think that it did anything to the zombie genre that was like so great that a tv show had to be written around this universe right well what we don't know too is i mean if they're using this ip it may be they may be taking some poetic license with how they tell that story. I mean, they may just kind of be borrowing those characters in the universe and doing something yeah. a little different with it or telling the story from a different perspective. If, like we, we don't know what they're going to be doing. If they go in there and they literally just tell the story of The Last of Us 1 beat for beat, I, I don't think that's a successful TV show, right? Because it – okay. Break, you know, break the audience into two groups. People that have never played The Last of Us, like they're obviously not gamers. Because if you're a gamer, you're at least probably familiar with The Last of Us to some extent, right? Right. That group of people already heard that story or played that story. Did a better version of that story where they were a part of it with a controller in their hand. Yeah. Okay. Take this other group of people who aren't gamers. The Last of Us doesn't mean anything to them. Like sure. it is, it is just, it's a video game, but they're not gamers. So why do they care? And then it's another zombie story with the same beats as every other zombie story. Yeah. So if you're going to tell that same story, um, I, I don't really s- kind of see the point. Like the story has been told in, through a better medium. No, I, I totally agree with you. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see. Cause like you said, HBO doesn't typically produce garbage and you've got the creator of Chernobyl. And I mean, that, that story certainly could have been pretty mundane as well and they I mean, that was really the best fantastic job with it yeah. so yeah, that's the best tv thing i've watched this year yes i, I don't watch a lot of tv but i think i think people who watch a lot of tv also agree with that though yeah yeah so when you get the creator of chernobyl and you get neil Druckmann in, in, in a room and you give them 
the the resources they need to do something great. I'm on I'm, opti- HBO, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. If they make it as gritty as they should be, which eight, the the fact that it's on HBO and you know that they're going to be able to make it whatever they want it to be. Like look at yeah. some of the stuff. Uh, Oh God, the the Song of Ice and Fire, what, what, right? Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones. There you go. I I didn't watch it, but look at some of the stuff they did, dear Lord. So HBO will let you do whatever you want. You've created a license over there. Oh, for that sure. it, I am excited about it from that standpoint. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So you added something to the news. You actually are pulling your weight as a co-host. What do you have for us? Yeah, so so what I I looked through all the gaming news online. I was like, this is kind of boring, and I was like, you know what we should talk about? We should talk about the coronavirus. Oh yeah, and how is that? Nobody's talking about the coronavirus. We gotta, we gotta cover it. About it. But you know what? We very well may be the only video game podcast to be uh, emphasizing here, right? No, <laughs> really, I don't know. I don't listen to other video game podcasts. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, but but here's you know here's the thing, right? For for the past couple years, we have been talking about could this be the death of E3? E3 is downfalling, and, and if anybody's listening to this and doesn't know, E3 is the the biggest gaming show of the year. Um, for about two decades, uh, all of the major players in the video game world would all come together. Um, they would all have huge spaces on, in a, basically an auditorium. Um, where they would set up stations to show off their new games. And then each uh, major publisher would have um, an opportunity to have a big press conference. And this is where like all of the news, every new game that's coming out in the next year would get announced here. Every people would mark it on their calendar. It, I mean, it was an absolute event. It was Christmas for gamers, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All, some of the greatest moments of uh, video gaming history come through from E3, like the, the announcement of the PlayStation 4 and the uh, Xbox One and all of that drama between uh, the DRM and the digital only and the Xbox and then Sony coming out with their disc in a hand and said, we're going to show you how you share video games on a PlayStation 4. And he hands the disc to the guy next to him and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Like was was that E three? Yeah, that was at E three. Okay, like cause on I, cause the presentation I know, stage. Because I know they did their like kind of their tech drop reveal kind of back in February, but I couldn't remember what they actually did at E three. Yeah, so so it was a big deal because uh, Microsoft went first, and everybody was so mad. And Sony had twenty four hours to rework their conference, and there's like conflicting ports, reports on how much they reworked it to react to the reaction True. of the Xbox, but um. Yeah, they walked out and they opened with literally handing a case from one guy on stage <laughs> to another. And that's how you share games on the PlayStation 4. I that's mean, awesome. e- E3 has, has been, you know, a huge part of uh, gaming culture for, for about, you know, 20 years, maybe even longer. That, that, but that's how long I know of. But recently, um, it's been declining. For a long time, Nintendo stopped showing up, and instead of having a big press conference on stage and having a huge floor pr- presence, instead they started releasing videos, um, basically just saying whatever they wanted to say, put it up on YouTube, and everybody could stream it digitally. Yeah, the Nintendo Directs have been huge for n- Nintendo, and with PlayStation copying it with State of Play, and I think Xbox has their own little thing that they do now. So it's obviously a good way to get in touch with your audience and tell them what's going on. And and it's well, probably a lot cheaper than doing that big conference, and you can do it as many times a year as you need to and kind of drop feed these little news bits out to people so that they're they're more engaged and they they're always kind of got their ear to the ground for what's what is the next thing that's that's happening and you, they don't have to wait for E3 for it. Yeah, so it, it's working, right? It works so well for Nintendo and that and Sony started doing their own, but Sony's were so successful that they said we're not going to go to E3. Like we're not going to go through all of that trouble. So with Nintendo out and Sony out, which is, you know, the first parties, the ones who actually manufacture the consoles, the only first party left uh, was Microsoft and they were really uh, 2019 was the first year that Microsoft was the only major publisher there. Um, I think Bethesda was still there and some of the third party ones, but even EA had done their own thing, like literally across the street from E3, but still not at E3. Um, yeah, so Xbox Microsoft was the only, the X Microsoft was the only like big three gaming, like 
console manufacturers there last year. Yeah. Yep. So they're really kind of propping up E3, this mainstay of uh, gaming culture for the past 20 years. But this year, the coronavirus is happening. And uh, Los Angeles County, where E3 is located, has declared a state of emergency and has started putting restrictions on big indoor gatherings. Um, On top of that, Game Developer Conference, which is similar to E3, but not really as big, not really quite as iconic, uh, is in San Francisco next week. And because of the coronavirus, Microsoft has completely pulled out of GDC. Yeah, a lot of people have. So if three months from now, when E3 comes, if the coronavirus is still an issue, there's still restrictions on big public gatherings, and Microsoft is forced this year to pull out of E3, what's left for them? I don't know. And like like you just said, a lot of people have been pulling out of GDC to the point where they canceled it or they postponed it. I, I'm seeing conflicting things here on whether it's canceled or postponed. Uh, I mean, if LA County is, if LA County is limiting the indoor gatherings and I don't, yeah, so, it's so going to be GDC in- is in San, San Francisco, which as far as I know, doesn't have the state of emergency, all that going on, but, but Microsoft as a company uh, has pulled out like similar well, to my, no, co- I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing this article on TechCrunch right now that, that they have canceled it. Like GDC is not a GDC is not happening uh, like it was supposed to and on the day it was supposed to. So let's say E3 gets canceled just this year because of the coronavirus. Yeah. Like with as many people have pulled out and Microsoft being the only one that's left. If E3 goes a year without there being an E3, I think it's done. And personally, I am incredibly disappointed because it was a moment like I would mark on my calendar months ahead of time. I would like stream it on my phone at work. You know, I, I would do anything I could to watch these giant marquee moments where the whole world stops and they watch all at once. And it's an event. It's a story. It's fun. And uh, I'm going to be really disappointed if we lose that because these little news update stream things that are polished and perfect and not live, they're fine. The news gets out. But it, it doesn't have that same like impact. It's it's right. it doesn't feel like the Super Bowl. Yeah, no, it, it is a little disappointing to see that sort of thing get fragmented because it's like, where do your big moments come from? Uh, I think E three will continue to exist in some form or another. It's just never going to be what it was, um, and I think we're just going to have to accept that. I. So I, I was uh, reading uh, some quotes from one of the heads of E3, like one of the head planners, right? And they said that they want E3 to still exist, but they don't know that it's forever going to exist in the form of a stage. Um, but but it can still mean something, even if it's maybe not a giant conference center. And in my opinion, why would any of the big three, like, why would they want to be a part of that? Why should I go through you to talk when me just throwing up a video on YouTube is going to get more traction or the same traction. And I don't have to include you like your right. extra work here. And you don't have to share the, the, the time with other, I mean, it could be just your time. Yep. And I think though, I, I really hope this comes back around because I think uh, while they all hated splitting the news, like splitting the headlines with each other, I think they don't maybe are uh, underestimating the value of everybody looking at once. Because I'm right. gonna be honest with you, Sony has come out with three or four state of plays. Now I don't actually know because I haven't seen them all. Because it, they come out at random times, they're unexpected. They're you know they pop up here and there. It, it, it's I don't catch them all. Right. And I think for the hardcore fans, that's probably what they want. But then you're kind of relying on word of mouth from them to spread that news. And the kind of more casual people or the or the dads like you and me, who just don't have our ear to the ground and we just don't have the time to, to focus on that. Like, we're not going to hear it until maybe even weeks later, when, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, E3 was such a big deal. Like, you know, there's a giant sector of people who buy consoles who aren't don't have their ear to the ground like the 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 mom who has a seven-year-old like e3 was the kind of thing when big news came out like uh your cnn or not cnn but like the news channels would be like in this week a big announcement from sony that the new playstation will be ready for the holiday season yeah like 
it made headlines in places that weren't just GameSpot.com or, or your favorite video game podcast. Sure. So, th- well, that'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. But I don't think coronavirus is going to end E3. I think, I think in a way, E3 ended E3. Um, yeah, so. it's just a convenient <laughs> nail in the coffin. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Speaking of nail in the coffin, I'm going to take us over to an article at IGN by Matt Kim called How GameStop Plans to Save Itself. GameStop is struggling. The specialty video game retailer has seen declining profits since the accelerating growth of digital game purchases and the rise of online retailers like Amazon over the past decade. In 2017, the company announced plans to close 150 stores after a 13.6% year-over-year drop in global sales. In 2018, GameStop reported a massive 488.6 million USD third quarter loss, and there were plans to sell the business, a plan which ultimately ended without a buyer. GameStop then reported another half billion dollar loss in 2019, accompanied by further layoffs. But in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the company is running a series of experimental store changes that may determine the future of the company. Instead of game sales and infamous trade-ins, GameStop's leadership is wondering if it can turn the nation's most recognizable specialty game store into a space people want to spend time in the week, time in week after week. So basically, this article goes on to say that GameStop is testing these new, they're calling it GameStop 2.0, and they have these four pillars that they're going to try to, to get people to come into the store more. So the first thing they're trying is community areas, so they'll have like couch co-op stations, tabletop stations, casual hangout areas, that sort of thing. Um, that, that they're calling GameStop 2.0, which I think is this overarching thing that they're trying to do then they have gamestop social which is like watch parties esport competitions coding classes that sort of thing um gamestop retro with their plan is to build a large collection of pre-owned retro games um have some old school crt tv set up and some areas where you can kind of sit down and play those and then gamestop pop which is aimed at hardcore collectors so you're talking gaming collect collectibles apparel accessories that sort of thing um, and I guess this is their new plan moving forward, their new business model. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think any of it speaks to me. Um, I'm going to go ahead. What do you think? I'm going to go on record here and say this is not going to work. Uh, this is their death throes here. Their back's against the wall. Um, th- it's like one dying business is uh, video game stores. And it's like, oh, okay, let's make ourselves more like another dying business, arcades. Right. Uh, <laughs> or, or like, let's make ourselves into the mom and pop shops that we put out of business. Yeah, it, you know, and especially, the, here's the biggest problem with GameStops. Like, okay, think about your town. Uh, I bet you there are five GameStops within a 10-mile radius if you live in a suburban area. And it, it's insane. They're, they're everywhere. They're packed in. So why could they do that? How could they do that? It's because video games uh, inventory, you know, you know, they're very small items, right? High dollar, relatively high dollar items to their space. So their stores are very small. And if you want to turn this into this giant uh, place for watch parties and uh, couch co-op and CRT TVs, uh, you're not going to fit that in these small locations. So the question is then, yeah, do you shut down all of your small locations and are you buying new property to fit all of this? And at that point, like, why? And what are you doing? <laughs> Wait, what are you doing? <laughs> I just, I don't understand. To me, so th- I, one of their executives is quoted on here. It's a, it's a Chinese proverb and I think it's really good. I mean, it's a neat idea. Uh, You know, it's kind of that whole, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is today. Okay, cool. Pivot. I get it. It is just so frustrating as like somebody who's shopped at GameStop for a really long time to see this decline and be rooting for them because you don't want this type of retail space to go away forever. And then you're just at the mercy with what digital storefronts decide to do with it. And you can never have a pre-owned game. I mean, that's how I saved money on games for years and that's where they made most of their money as well and their their profit margins in used games were way higher than their new games and honestly they were probably way higher than they should have been which is what led to the decline i mean they they t- i just feel like they're blockbuster they saw digital they didn't pivot they got caught like a deer in the headlights and they took advantage of their customers for so long and then as a way to try to leverage their their business and try to become prof- profitable, instead of pivoting their business model, they just did it harder and they got predatory. And 
they start taking away all of their their bonuses like every advantage that there ever was for buying physical and buying pre-owned they just sunk it and they did that to themselves and and now this i just don't feel like this is going to save them speaking of the predatory part like that is the absolute most irritating part like at some point i stopped going to gamestop and i just walked into walmart to buy a new game instead well for two reasons one because half the time they didn't have the game which is just comical considering that's the only thing they sell that's all you do like the new star wars game i walked in there uh five days after the game came out and i was like hey i want to buy that uh, star wars game and they're like oh we don't have it we could call the seven other stores in town and see uh, uh which one might and i was like yeah no walmart's next door sorry right yeah uh, and, and the other thing is it was so irritating when you're checking out they're like would you like to apply for a credit card no are you sure yeah no i no no and then it's like okay well would you like to sign up for gamers club no, would you like to sign up for Super Gamers Club? Right. And I'm like, dear Lord, take do you my, want my money. insurance on your game. <laughs> oh my yeah, do you want insurance on your uh, on your game? Like that's a, like that's a necessary thing. Um, yeah, don't make your com- uh, customers uncomfortable. That should probably be rule number one. Yeah, it, it's beyond frustrating. And then they had their whole um, I don't remember what their what what was their gaming club called but is it just gamers club yeah that was that was they rolled back well whatever their version of gamers club was they rolled back the benefits of it yeah but they they, the price is the same (laughs) so they're like oh yeah instead of getting uh 10 percent off all used games now you get a five dollars gift card per month that expires at the end of the month and it's a one-time use thing and they have to know that the customers aren't going to respond well to that Right. right, but this had to be like they're having cash flow problems. This was a way to to bring in more quickly, and yeah. then try to use that cash to to pivot the business. I okay, let's throw the ball in our court though. It's very easy to criticize uh, someone else's terrible ideas, but <laughs> let's say you are the CEO of GameStop. I'm put you on the spot here. What are you doing? How, how, what are you going to do about this? So I said this last week. I don't know if it's possible, but I feel like. If I had the weight of GameStop, the thing I would try to do is, as you said, the the profit margins are on the pre-owned games. I would try to work with publishers to create a secondhand market for digital games. And I I said it last week, so I don't want to I don't necessarily want to drone on about it, but I really feel like they missed a huge opportunity if they weren't trying to do that. So, okay, I I agree that that needs to be done. I don't agree that GameStop is even in the realm of companies that could pull that off because right you got to look at their core competencies as a company they are brick and mortar retail that's what they do well what they don't do well is online have you ever gone so true (laughs) have you ever gone to gamestop.com yeah no i will say their new app is actually not bad in terms of like keeping track of what stock is where and and you can like go in and hold a game um, and that sort of thing, which was nice, but yeah, no, their online in general is so frustrating. Like I remember back in the day, I bought a PlayStation VR from GameStop, and I think I bought it pre-owned, so it was like certified. It may have been a refer, but the point is, is I went into the store. They totally got me on the shipping. It was so frustrating because they tricked me into buying a membership by telling me shipping would be free. But I'm pretty sure shipping would have been free if I just shipped it to the store. But they didn't tell me that. So they tricked me into getting it shipped to to my house. Then it took two and a half weeks to get there. Meanwhile, I could have just paid 15 extra dollars to get it from Amazon. It would have been on my doorstep in two days. And I understand that these other retailers... So they can afford to sell games as a loss leader to get you into the store and GameStop can't afford that. And, and that that's why you see, market. yeah. And that's why you see stores like Best Buy and Walmart doing these things where if you pre-order from them, you can get 15 bucks off a new game. So you can go into a game, uh, a Walmart and get, you know, a, a brand new game for 45, 50 bucks or whatever it is. Uh, and GameStop just simply can't afford to do that. Um, but at the same time, it it's really frustrating to see how they've, chosen to try to combat that yeah so what what would you do then what would you do you're the ceo of gamestop all right first thing i would do right take a step back if someone wants to buy a game right now i still feel like 
uh, there is a natural, like, it does feel good to go into a gaming store to buy a game. Like, there's something, like, so unceremonious about walking into a Walmart and hunting down some employee with a key to be like, oh, True. this one. Like, it's just, <laughs> doesn't, like, I don't know. It doesn't have that same uh, right. uh, feeling to it. So, okay, step one, if I'm the game GameStop CEO, we are going to be good at what we're supposed to be good at. We are going to have uh, games in stock right? We are going to have a better website that is, uh, this is the place to go to buy physical copies of uh, video games. And there's a lot of people who prefer physical copies. Yeah, I mean, I'm personally one of them. I have a data cap I can, uh, at my house, which is ridiculous, but that's a whole nother story. So, we are going to be the absolute best. When you walk into the GameStop, we are going to have the game you want in stock quickly ready for you if you buy it online we will ship it to you fast as you know let's get that down to amazon-esque today find a way to make it happen uh free shipping so be good at what you're supposed to be good at like that's step one and if that business model isn't profitable enough for them to survive frankly i don't know that they have any other core competencies that make them a viable company no i mean honestly they're turning into spencers with all the cheap garbage collectible stuff that's in that store which just takes shelf space that could have been used games or whatever i mean i think that the retro game thing is kind of cool because there aren't a lot of places that i know of that are like corporate that you could go in and buy a super nintendo game so like that aspect of it kind of cool do i own a super nintendo no do i have any (laughs) desire to no (laughs) like it's yeah it's also one of those things where it's like oh that's so cool but am i actually when's the last time i've actually opened my wallet to buy an snes game yeah true so I don't know. I don't really know who that's for, but I'm sure there are some collectors out there. But I'm also sure that GameStop is going to probably try to rip people off on those prices and they're just going to go on eBay and get like the pristine conditioned one that hasn't been like re plastic wrapped by yeah. GameStop. So, OK, just thinking about what else I would do, you know, I would shut down, you know. My town is going to have one GameStop. There doesn't need to be one on every corner. This was something actually I read about uh, McDonald's that I thought was really fascinating. It used to be that McDonald's literally did not care to put a McDonald's on one side of the road and the other side of the road. And it was all about, and they put their sign with a giant M way up in the sky. And it was all about if you see McDonald's, if we are what you see more than the other fast food restaurants, then you're going to come to us more than them because you can see us and you don't see them. Mm -hmm. But there was a change when everybody started bringing up their phone with their maps apps and looking and say, Oh, where do I want to eat today? Scroll, 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 click. And I'm not looking anymore. So McDonald's pivoted and they said, we're not going to open as many stores. We're going to have one store around instead of two, because people navigate instead of just look. Um, it's so it's no longer important to have a brick and mortar store everywhere. You just need to have one within a reasonable distance. So if I was them, I, I would use the McDonald's new strategy and I would consolidate locations totally um, to the one with the biggest floor space. And then you, maybe you do do some of this, um, but you don't need seven of them in town. That's a lot of extra overhead. And I'm not convinced it's extra money. No, I'm not convinced either. So Anyway, so, well, we've drawn on that for a long time. I think bottom line is uh, I'm I'm wishing for the best for GameStop, but I just think this is maybe too little too late. I'm kind of impressed they're going to, it seems like they're going to make it to the next gen and maybe they'll get a little bump, but I just don't know that it's enough. I feel like eventually they're going to be going the way of Blockbuster. So that is the end of the news. Okay, perfect transition. (laughs) All right, let's go into our next topic, which is what have you been playing? Now, Greg, I know you're a busy guy. I know you've got a pretty demanding job. You have a weird night schedule. Um, You've got a new baby who's seven months old. Your wife works full-time too. You've got to juggle the nanny. You've got to be flipping your days to your nights and all this kind of thing. Man, don't make it sound so fun. (laughs) (laughs) What's the last game you actually played? And don't tell me Outer Worlds because we've talked Outer Worlds to death. What else have you played? Dear Lord, Outer Worlds is the literal last thing I've played, but we don't need to talk that one. Um, I'll actually take this in a, a, a second direction here of what i am like about to start playing tonight after we hang up this this call okay so 
you know, when I started doing this podcast, I was like, I'm going to get paid in, uh, when I started mixing this for you guys, I was like, I'm going to get paid in love and admiration from the host. <laughs> yes. That's all we can afford to give you right now. And then I clicked play on the first audio and it opened with do, 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 do. Craig sucks. And I was like, wait, I'm not getting paid in love and admiration. What? Yes. This is, this is terrible. Why am I doing this? But then Jason sent me an iPad and I am taking uh, this iPad as payment for my uh, work. I'm telling this Jason, that's a Jason. Oh, as, great. as But you're speaker. also going to pay me for that, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take off like 25% <laughs> discount for, for my effort on this podcast uh, for you in lack of love and admiration. Okay, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But with that said, I'm actually really excited to do some gaming on this iPad. And uh, if you're like a gamer, you're probably absolutely cringing right now. No, I'm not going to be playing Fortnite with like fake, no, not actual controller thumbsticks. I can't do that. I am a gamer. I need a controller in my hand. Sure. But with that said... There is a time and a place for iPad gaming. One, you can connect a Bluetooth controller. Like you could play, mm-hmm. you could play uh, Fortnite with it or whatever. Uh, but what I'm actually interested in and what I'm going to start playing tonight is Civ 6 is on iPad. Really? Yes. And I think actually a touch interface for that game is far superior than a mouse and a keyboard. It is one of the very, very, very rare exceptions where I would say that. That is super interesting because now is it the full game or is it like a dumbed down version of it? No, I am. I'm not 100% confident, but I remember when it was back when it was coming out that they uh, a reason they dumbed down the graphics on PC is because they wanted to be able to release the same game everywhere. Hmm. Um, which is why like it looks like super cartoony on PC and some people were really hoping that it would look more realistic and gritty and it, it didn't happen. Um. But with that said, I am going to start playing that. I am a huge fan of Civ. Um, it is one of the few PC games that I ever really got into outside of the greatest game of all time. We might talk about a little bit later, Diablo right, 2. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, you, I will be super interested. You'll definitely have to follow up and, and let us know how that is. Because, yeah, I mean, I would, I would imagine it's probably akin to like the Switch version of the game. Because I, I would say that... The 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 um, iPad and the, the Nintendo Switch probably have similar graphical capabilities. So yeah, um, I mean, well, you got a Switch is what three hundred dollars, and the iPad is about what, the same. About the same price. So they, I yeah. mean, you would expect their internals to probably be comparable. Yeah, and that iPad's like two years newer than the Switch, so it's probably a little bit nicer in terms of the processor. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. And also, you know, as a, like Jason mentioned, you know, I know your typical podcast host for this podcast are 30 year old uh, dads with jobs and families. Well, I'm a, I'm a 25 year old dad with a job and a family. Um, pretty close enough, right? Yeah. And and playing an iPad game is is easier, and a turn based game is easier with a seven month old baby because sure. I can set it up and click with one hand while I'm bouncing them with the other, and set it down and come back. You know, because it's turn-based, it's not live action. Yeah, that's totally valid, I think. And not to mention, like I said, they they just started uh, natively. They just started natively allowing you to remote play your PlayStation Four on the iPad. So that means you can also pair that controller natively, like the actual DualShock Four. So um, I I think you're going to get a lot of use out of that, and hopefully, it, it allows you to have a little bit more time for gaming. So that next time you're on here, you have something. Something else to talk yeah, about. Yeah, because we don't need to talk the outer worlds anymore. Right. Um, so, quick question, though, before we yeah. before we leave this topic, because I, I did a quick search, and it, it does seem to be basically the full game here. Why? I don't understand how they get away with this. The same exact game launched on PC for $60 and on uh-huh. the iPad for $20. And and it's because I understand it's because of customer expectations. Like people sure. like refuse to spend. It's an app. It should be free. Yeah. <laughs> and like people refuse to spend money on apps and stuff. But it's it's it kind of blows my mind that they can get away with that. Yeah, it's so uh, strange. I think one thing that's probably different though is that I don't think any of the expansions are coming to the iPad. I don't know why that would make it cheaper, no, but maybe it's just they, they came later, but they're out now. Oh, they're, they're out now. Yeah, the Gathering Storm expansion is is out. So I I don't know. I, I'm a little bit bewildered, but uh-huh. I will. 
I don't know. It's funny, like the Super Mario uh, app, they tried to launch it for $10. Like, just $10. It's a right. full blown Mario game for $10. You buy it once. There's no in app purchases. And it just completely flopped. No one bought it. Well, they made a cool, like, five, I can't remember how many, like five or 50 million. I can't remember. <laughs> I know I'm off by a factor of 10 there, but they, <laughs> they made a pretty good chunk of change on that day one. Like, I know I bought that day one. I was a little disappointed because being a long term Mario fan, it's just so. A little dumbed down, and then at the time I was flying more, and the fact that you had to be connected to the network to be able to play it, I was like, "Well, I can't play this on the plane. I don't get service at work, so I can't. I can't play it in the bathroom at work. Like, what is this game for?" Yeah, and you know, they they the DRM thing, the always online necessity, right? It's because you're afraid of people, you know, hacking and basically getting a, a ripped copy of it downloaded or whatever. Am I like, but how many iPhone users do you know that have like jailbroken iPhones? Like this, it's not really a real fear anymore, right? I know. Yeah. I don't actually know a single person. <laughs> like, I don't know a single person who is like side loading apps onto their phone. No. I, I'd, I'd rather pay $10 than go through that trouble. I know. Seriously. I mean, it's the same thing with music right now, right? Like I, I could easily download illegal music or whatever. Sure. It's just if Apple Music is like ten bucks a month, like I, yeah, you know. Well, and and I feel like when you are creating something like this, your job is to compete with free, and so you're asking people to pay you something, but you're giving them convenience or you're giving them just ease of use or access to a giant library of whatever that is. So I think like you've seen Netflix. I think Netflix impacted pirating greatly because it's just oh, like, absolutely. why would I go through the trouble of pirating this stuff when I could pay 10 bucks a month for Netflix and just have access to this huge library? So I think the advent of streaming, um, I hope that we, I think, I think digital marketplaces have done that for games in some ways. Like I, I'm sure steam's curbed pirating because you know, you could go through the trouble of pirating it and then getting it to work and then, you know, making sure you have all the right driver versions and all this stuff and uh, making sure you're launching it the right way, making sure you, oh, I got to drag this DLL file to like this yeah. file folder and do all this stuff or just pay five bucks for that game on Steam. I mean, yeah, it's, whatever. And, and some people are willing to go through all of that. And at that point, it's OK. You're not, you know, you're not going to stop that person. But no. something people will always pay for is convenience and I mean, I think that applies to all places in life. You look at all the like uh, markets that are opening up and growing right now. They're all markets of convenience. They're not. For sure. They're not innovation anymore. It's it's, um, you know, how can we make your life a little bit easier? Because you know, you know, this whole podcast is all about people being pressed for time and still wanting to play video games. Yeah. But we we know we see that with all people with all hobbies right now. There's there's not enough time to do everything everyone wants to. So. Yeah. If there's something I can pay for that's going to win me back an hour of my day, okay, let's like let's go. I'm with it. Absolutely. 100%. 100% Karch. 100%. That joke was for one person. <laughs> um, okay. The so one what person a, we know will probably be listening to at least yes, most of this. Yes. <laughs> and let me let me tell you everybody who's listening, which is probably just Karch corrections are going to be on point this week because Karch is going to make sure every single thing we said that was wrong gets corrected next week. <laughs> um, okay, so I have been playing two things. One was Final Fantasy VII Remake demo. And I mean, we... So last week we recorded on Thursday. Today is Sunday. So it's only been a few days. I haven't really had a lot of time to play anything. So if you want to hear about... That go listen to episode two. Uh, Karch and I have a pretty long, in depth discussion around that game. The other thing is, Greg, you and I have been playing Hitman Two, but in a little bit of an interesting way. Yeah, so let's start. Uh, let's go ahead and start there. And well, I want to circle back around to Final Fantasy VII Remake. I actually have some questions for you about that one. Okay. But we have been using a website called Dixper to play. Uh, basically, like kind of like couch co-op except for we're on other sides of the country yeah so that's d-i-x-p-e-r and essentially what it is is exactly what greg said it is a game streaming service one person will host and then you'll send a invite link to the other person and then it's kind of like any other game streaming service where the host is hosting the content and the person on the other end can see the screen. They can control it with their controller. And depending on your internet speed, 
Uh, I mean, honestly, even when I had uh, 100 megabytes down and 10 up, it was still pretty good. Now I have uh, fiber, so I have one gig down and one gig up, which I think made it even better. But I mean, this is a free thing that you can do. And like, Greg, you and I, that was always our favorite thing growing up was to play single player games, but then pass them back and forth. And we haven't been able to do that in years. And now we can. And I think it's incredible. Yeah. So, so just to make sure we're painting like a really clear picture of what this is like on my computer monitor and Jason's computer monitor, it's showing the video game. I have a controller in my hand and Jason has a controller in his hand. We're playing the same game and basically we can toggle whose controller is controlling the game. And, you know, we hop on a chat, like an audio call with each other, and we're just sitting there playing a video game together, hanging out. Like, we're like, as if we're in the same house. Yeah, it is like being in the same room, which has been amazing. The yeah. hard part is finding a night that Greg's not sleeping, but... <laughs> no, 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 no. The hard part, <laughs> The hard part is finding a night where Jason's awake. No! Give no, no, me a no, break. No, 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 you don't understand. I wake up at midnight. Yeah, that's true. You're, it's your fault for not being awake at 3 a.m. <laughs> hey, I, I'm, I'm ready to game any night of the week, man. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, but when I'm like, oh, I'll call you at 11, and then I call you and you don't answer, I'm like, ah, I don't know what he's doing. So this, this crack, you know, for, you know, work at night shift, one of the interesting things you'll find is you start, like, relating different times of the day differently. So, like, 7 p.m. for me is, like, 5 a.m. for most people. So how would you like to get uh, phone calls to play video games at 5 a.m.? If you're listening <laughs> to this, how would you enjoy that? Like, yeah, uh, I love video games, man. It's five in the morning. Go to bed. Right. <laughs> Wake up and start drinking with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, we're going to the club. Oh, my God. Club at 5 a.m. Okay, yeah. let, let's do it, I guess. Yeah. Oh, oh but factory yeah, but life, man. In, oh, for real. But in terms of the actual game, like, how do you find Hitman 2? Are you enjoying it? Would you recommend it? <sighs> I am enjoying playing the game with you probably more than I am enjoying the game itself, but okay. that's not a knock on the game. Like, it's just really hard for me to kind of judge the game for its own merits. I'll say if you like slow, methodical, thought out gameplay, this is like the, the peak of the mountain for you. This is the best I've ever seen for that kind of thing. Oh yeah, it's it's in, it's it's this. Just you feel like you're in a sandbox, and the sandbox is huge, and you can beat each one of these missions so many different ways if you want to follow the breadcrumbs and figure out how to do it. It's um, it's one of those things where it's one of those games that's open enough to where you're like. I wonder if I did this, this, and this, and then this fell on this person's head, and then this did this. Oh my God, if everything worked out, wouldn't it be crazy if the game let me do that? And this game lets you do that. Yes, it, it's insane. Uh, so here's where I come down on it. I, it's for whatever reason, I felt like I enjoyed the first game a little bit more, but I think it's maybe because it was a little easier. Uh, I'm finding this one to be really difficult to actually execute your plan. Yeah, I do think that if, uh, and you got to be careful when you're saying Hitman 1 versus Hitman 2 because they did some weird naming conventions. And uh, that's like, true. So if you, the Hitman from like 2016 or whatever. Yeah, I, I will say if you're going to buy one, I literally think it's the same engine. Like, I literally can't tell the difference. It's the same mechanics, it's the same engine. It's very, very, very similar. Um, the studio that did it is the same studio, but the owning company of that studio let them go between Hitman 1 and Hitman 2. So when they spun off into their own company, they kept... Which was I I.O., right? Yeah, I believe so. Cards will let us know next week. No, no, no. I'm looking it up. It's IO <laughs> Interactive, and they Square owned the IP, but they when IO got divested, they allowed IO to buy to like retain this intellectual property. Yeah, and they are uh, so they're at this point basically. Uh, I mean, they're not an indie studio. I mean, they're still sizable, but they don't have the big backing of one of the big third parties. Um, so they used a lot of the same assets, they used the same engine, they used a lot of the same gameplay, and then they made another game. So with all of that said, if you're going to buy one of these, the 2016 Hitman 1 uh, is probably going to be cheaper yeah. and is literally no worse. Like there's no nothing upgraded in the second one where I think you should 
spend the extra money. No, I mean, the sandbox is a little bigger, but in, I mean, for the most part, I, I haven't really noticed a big difference. Yeah. So, okay, so that's what we've been playing uh, for the most part, and I agree with everything Greg said in terms of if you're going to buy Hitman 1, Hitman 2, and you like that kind of game, if you've never played either, start with Hitman 1. Um, yeah. It's episodic, so it's a little confusing, but you can get the complete quote-unquote season, um, and, and I think that can be had for under 20 yeah, so me and Jason, neither one of us are particularly story oriented gamers. I think that's we're not true. I am. I don't know, man. Not as much as some people. Like, okay, I skip cutscenes. You like, do. I do I, not. Greg, fill time. I have to. I have to go to the bathroom. Fill O-M-G. time. M G. Fill okay. time. I will oh, okay. be surprised with whatever you say. Tell a story. I'll be right back. Uh, two seconds. Man, if you could speak to an audience of who knows how many singles tens dozens of people maybe less than 10 what would you say hmm i guess it'd be a good time to tell everybody that the witcher if you don't like story it's like a crappy skyrim i don't know man if i wanted to watch a story i'm gonna turn on the tv i'm here to play some video games let's play give me a controller now look man if if you're into something else Whatever. You do you. But when I sit down to play a video game, you know what I want to do? I want to hit something with a sword, and I want to shoot something, and I want to jump on something. I don't want to watch a movie. You ready? Ooh, where are we jumping back into? I want to ask you some questions about Final Fantasy VII Remake Demo. Okay, perfect. Did you play Final Fantasy VII? Uh, not the original, no. You did not play the original Final Fantasy VII. So, if... So you don't have the nostalgia for this game? No. Because my personal fit theory is that nobody cares about this game unless they played the original. I, well, okay. I think you're right to an extent. So like, you're going to get the Karches who have a lot of love for Final Fantasy. You might even get some people who liked the later Final Fantasies but had never played this one. Um, and then I think just... On its own merit, it's a good game. It's a fun game. You're probably not going to get any non-JRPG fans, t- to be completely honest. But, I mean, it's you played Final Fantasy XV. I would say it's... I mean, I, I, it feels like the combat's maybe closest to that, but even a little bit more refined and more fun. I, don't, I mean, I had, I had a good time with it. So, confession, I bought Final Fantasy XV and never opened it. Oh my gosh, do you still have it? Probably. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I don't really care because I don't I don't think that was like the best one or anything. It's just the fact that you bought it and didn't open it. I know, dude, it's never free to play. I mean, it is uh the theme of this podcast is really true. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So so is it so does it stand on its merits though? Like, is it fun enough gameplay to where you're like, because the JRPG, right? That's like very time consuming genre. Yeah. Is that something you're willing to put your 20, 30 hours into? Well, first of all, a JRPG would be more like 60, 70 hours, but it sounds True. like, it sounds like they're going to break this game into some manageable pieces. So, I mean, after playing the demo, I would totally consider mooching off cards to play this for free. <laughs> dude i i don't think uh that it's not in the cards for me I, if i wanted to play a final fantasy game i would go find my plastic wrapped final fantasy 15 go play the demo of this though i mean you might be surprised is my my complaint with games like this is the combat feel, always feels so unconsequential you and you're not gonna get it's not dark souls man it's it's not guard of war um but it's fun yeah, you just I don't have know. to. It's, okay, look, so you you played Dragon Age Origins, right? Or Dragon I, Age I, In- I, Inquisition? I really enjoyed it, but I played Dragon Age, the newest Dragon Age Inquisition, as a as a turn based game. You can kind of play it like that. It's not oh. going to be fully turn based, but it's going to be like you can slow time down, plan out your attack, that sort of thing. Well, you know, I might actually be into it because I have been really, really, really itching. Uh, for an in-depth RPG. And maybe this is going to be the next one that hits because we are really in a drought. I can't speak to the RPG elements of this in terms oh, it's of... it's a Final like, Fantasy game. I'm sure they're, they're going to be there. Okay, you know what I mean? Well, like, they're, yeah. they're not going to... 
That's a crutch question. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I, I just can't. I can't imagine them making a Final Fantasy game without some in-depth RPG elements. Like they are invented the JRPG, right? I don't know if they invented it, but they definitely are one of the highly renowned ones that we still make them. So, okay, so that's what we've been playing. But Greg, I have to ask you this. Maybe you already answered it in kind of the last segment with the Civ Six. But is there anything else you wish you have been playing? So, yeah, there is some things I wish I've been playing that I think there is almost a 0% chance that I get to play, unfortunately. That's what the segment's all about. Uh Uh-huh. So, I am a VR enthusiast. Massively. I So, like, there has been a few times in my life where I've had this very unique feeling where something great is around the corner, and I'm like, okay, Greg don't accidentally die between now and when this thing happens because I cannot wait for it. <laughs> what is it this time? Well, well, let's tell you what some of the other times was okay. like, like a couple weeks before my son was born. I was like, I really want to be there for that. <laughs> <laughs> try couple, not to die. <laughs> try not to die. A couple weeks before my wedding. I was like, Oh my God, it's coming. This is going to be great. Um, I felt that way about, my PlayStation VR getting to me for the first time in 2015. Oh, yeah. And I so enthusiastic about it. And every time I have a new person come to my house, I put them in VR. I'm like, hi, you're delivering pizza? Come on in. No, but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I absolutely love it. With that said, it is impossible to find time to play VR because especially as a dad, especially... uh being that I work night shift and my wife works day shift and they're the waking hours where we're all together. Um, it's very, it's, you don't want to use that time secluded so much to where like your eyes and your ears are, are completely blocked off to the world and you are completely somewhere else. I mean, that's the magic of VR, but it's also the downside. Sure. Um, two games. I really, really want to find the time to find a way to play though. One is Asgard's wrath. And it is kind of like the marquee title, like in terms of combat, world development, RPG elements, it is the most uh, ambitious VR game that we have seen. Have you heard anything about it? I have heard you talk about it, but I haven't. I know it's it's an it looks like it's an Oculus uh, exclusive. Yeah. So they this was like they were like, we need a killer app. We need something that can show developers that VR can be a real video game and not a glorified tech demo. So they set out on their own and were like, we can't convince someone else to make it. Like we're going to make it. And this was their, all, all the chips pushed in. This is our, uh, this is our monument to VR. I, I've seen, I think this is the one where you're it, it like the, the scale should be really interesting because you're this tiny little dude trying to fight like these gods or something right or maybe vice versa no so okay so what it is is it it switches perspectives so like and and there's times where you're this god where you were like you could see the world like you are huge and you can like play part of the game like that it's a little bit more strategic um and then though you go down into being a normal sized human and it's like hand-to-hand combat okay um so if you remember that like uh roman empire dueling kind of game where you had sword combat yes and it was like that indie game where it's just like basically a tech demo of hey sword fighting can be fun in vr yes so they took all the concepts of that except for made it like a triple a different types of monsters and 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 things to fight and different types of weapon and fully fledged that combat into an rpg that sounds really cool when yeah. is is this game out? This game is out. This game has been out for months. And the what fact we, that what I What are we doing, man? <laughs> I I know. And like I got to find time for this because this is everything. This was the promise of VR has finally come uh to fruition with this game and I I need to play it. How much is it? It's like a, it's a triple A game and it's probably 60 bucks. Hold on, let's see. But I, I don't up. know if it's on Steam. I think it might be Oculus only. It's only 40 bucks. Shoot, man. If you want to split this thing, some like let's do it. We gotta find time. We gotta find time to do yeah. Yeah, this is this is happening. I just got okay. myself re-excited for it. Okay. <laughs> the other thing I wish I was playing is in the same vein as No Man's Sky is uh for oh, PC. Yeah. 
in VR. That's the other promise of it. Like, imagine you could fly planet to planet in space adventure and in VR. Like, that's this is it. This is like Ender's Game or all of the the you know all the pop fiction. Like, this is it. It's here. Yeah, I mean that. That's one where we talked about getting it for each other for Christmas, and then like the the problem is, is the nights we find to play, it's so hard to like. Okay, it's two o'clock in the morning. Are we gonna stand up for the, you know and play VR uh, for however many yeah. hours? Yeah, we like, really like we just worked a whole work week. You want to like throw your arms around and jog in place like this, <laughs> or do you want to make a mixed drink, fire up Dixper, and pass him and two back and forth? Yeah, we got to find a time to do it though when we are both in the same town in that the same room yes. and just set it up because it's so much easier to set up because uh you know the new oculuses don't require base stations or anything so it's literally just plugging in the usb plugging in the hdmi and firing away yeah um maybe one of us can renew our wedding vows and then talk aaron and lauren into letting us have a bachelor party weekend where they (laughs) take the kids to a place and then you and me would just get the house to ourselves but it's just gonna be just the two of us though That's i it. say we just <laughs> do it i say we just show up to your house with aaron and devin and be like y'all want to have a mom's day bye oh that's a good idea I didn't that, think that about actually that. could work like like uh, let's do that a couple weeks from now i'm gonna be coming in town okay all right let's do it. bring your pc bring your vr we'll, we'll figure Doing it out it. it's a plan all right so my what do you wish you were playing but we'll probably never play I I have to say it's probably the Mass Effect trilogy because everybody who's played it, I think you've played it, right? Uh, At least the no. first one. I've played a little bit of Mass Effect 3, but oh, after okay. everybody talked about the ending of it and how mad they were about it, I just kind of was like, yeah, whatever. Well, I see, I, va- I only vaguely remember that because I didn't really pay as much attention to like the gaming news back then. It was more just like, oh, that game looks cool. I want to play it. But... A lot of people seeing the praises of the Mass Effect trilogy, I'm just afraid that I would put all that time into it and then it wouldn't live up to newer games that do the same thing, which is like this choice-driven, story-based RPG elements. Like, I, I feel like, will it compare to The Witcher and The Outer Worlds, given that those games are quite a bit newer and Mass Effect came out in 2007? Like, that's what I worry about. I just don't have time to, even though it's supposed to be a great game, I just like don't have time to waste on something that's I, that I don't know if I'm going to enjoy, you know? You know, it's, it's really, there was a golden age, really, I think in the PS3 era, really, that uh, had these RPGs that were just like iconic, amazing RPGs. And if there was one disappointment I've had about the PlayStation 4 generation is while we saw more open world games than ever, we lost the RPG open world massive superstar game. Like they, they, we just didn't have enough of them on PlayStation Four. And Mass Effect on uh, PlayStation Three, Mass Effect Two. And I know Mass Effect Three was, I think, a PlayStation Four, PlayStation Three like launch kind of window area. I think it was ended up being on both of them. Yeah. Um, but we didn't get these great iconic. We didn't get uh, an Elder Scrolls. Right? right on PlayStation 4. Uh, we didn't get, I guess we got The Witcher, and a lot of people would put it in the same category, but a, yeah. a lot of ways that's a more of a st- story driven than it is a create your own story. I agree. It's, and, it's, it's not really the one where you go get lost in the mountains and like stumble upon a dungeon and you're exactly. like. Exactly. <laughs> and Mass Effect's not that either, but it was this story that you kind of made your own through your choices in a more consequential way than most games. And I, I, if I have one disappointment about this generation, it's that we didn't get it. And it looks like the PlayStation 5 generation, where it's coming back. We got Cyberpunk 2077, we got Starfield, and we got the next Elder Scrolls. Um, all are going to hit at the very end of the PlayStation 4 era here. I am hoping that Bethesda has a revival with this next gen because they have made... It just feel like they've... Aside from Doom, they've just taken like punch after punch after punch with the decisions that they've made and the games that they've come out with and how they've chosen to support them. So I am like, I want Bethesda to succeed so badly. I'm hoping that they can get themselves together for this next gen. 
Yeah, you know, they're such an interesting company because for so long they were like the outsiders. Like they were the good guys. Yeah, they 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 people would show up on stage and they would cuss and it was gritty and they were like, "Oh, we can do whatever we want because we make video games." And like yeah. And then and then they started very rapidly expanding. Like they got their own stage at E3. Um and they started being looked more like an EA, right? And had all these studios under them. And you gotta have you have to wonder, is it that they're expanding too fast and they don't have the same amount of attention in company culture anymore? Or is it you know, no, or is it just perception? Because how much of what people have been mad about it, it really matters. And it's a good point because I, I think like I know for you and me, like we played the older scrolls online. I know you liked it. I I'm not really much of an MMO the guy. Awful. But that but but the, it's got a very lively uh, game, like user base now, it, it now, seems yeah. that they've really turned that around, and like people loved Doom that came out in 2016, yep. and uh, you know people didn't love Fallout 4, but I think it sold well. Um, but people I, liked it. It wasn't it wasn't New Vegas, but I do think it was a good game. I didn't beat it. I only got about 20 hours in. I mean, that's all I ever get into a game. So I mean, true. <laughs> you but, know, I mean, I guess, I guess my point is, is that they do, they have put out like these smaller titles, like Dishonored. And Dishonored, Dishonored Two is awesome. I know, but it's not a big title. And Prey, people loved Prey. That wasn't a big title. Um, you know, Rage Two. That it's 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 just it feels hit or miss with them. And well, so, um, the, you know, the big one that that really has got the public opinion against them was Fallout Seventy Six. Yes. And it's and it and I understand the reason these people were upset about it. You took a genre, uh, 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 an IP that is like the most iconic single player make your own adventure in the history of gaming is the Fallout series, mm-hmm. and they took it and said we are going to chase every single trend in popular gaming right now. Slap on the word Fallout on the front of it and see if we can cash in. Right. We're going to do a shared open world with uh, elements like uh, uh, the Fortnite element modes, like where you're the last they man had standing. A battle like, Royale in that? Oh my. Yes, yes. Are you serious? I was literally about to make a Battle Royale joke and they it, actually did it. Yeah. And, and, and that took all of these I'm people sorry. that are. Siri? That was Siri. Sorry, everybody. Wow, that was creepy. She needs to. She needs to, to chill calm, out. She needs to calm down a little bit. Don't butt into people's conversations. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but but yeah, so their their core audience uh, were people that preferred single player games, story driven games, and they released a Fallout game with no NPCs. Yeah, it seems like a huge misstep. I have no idea who greenlit that. How do you make the most story driven genre ever have no characters? <laughs> they, I, mean, I mean i gotta say if they really believed what they said it's kind of like okay cool people could be the npcs but like just nobody's gonna do that you know the, the audience i think the audience that has latched on and it does have a sustained audience i i think uh there are people for it the problem is it's not the same people that loved the other fallout games yeah they, they probably would have been better off just staying away from calling it Fallout. You know, what's interesting, though, is you say that you know, there were no NPCs. Like, they wanted the people to be the NPCs. And, and you know, it, Rockstar kind of pulled that off unintentionally with Red Dead 2's online. You've got these clans that, like, go around and pretend like everybody's in character. They're these, You know what I mean? You've heard those yeah, stories. That is really cool. Like, um, that'd be fun to be a part of. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's kind of what they were hoping for, and they just didn't cultivate that audience. So, well, you know, then they backtracked on it, right? There, they added a giant update that added a story and NPCs. <laughs> yeah, which is fine, but then they also added this. They shoehorned this like premium mode where they gave you the benefits of a bunch of things that are already free with a bunch of other similar types of games. So, like yeah, private it- private servers and blah 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 and. Crypt and like the currency, the in-game currency that you get, and so like, it does okay. feel like you know maybe maybe Bethesda has had some self-inflicted root wounds that are actually things worth being a little bit upset about. Uh, I'm not ready to call them the bad guys yet, though. No, uh, I'm, I'm, not I'm not ready to call them EA. No, you know it's they're not that they're not corporate video games. They are, but they're they're it's still not the same. They're just they. 
they just have a PR problem. <laughs> like, put, it, put it this way. If they put out an Elder Scrolls game tomorrow, every single one of us is going to buy it. True. And we might complain about it and be like, it's not as good as The Witcher 3. Yeah. But no. we'd still buy it. So. Yeah. Well, The Witcher fans, uh, they have Cyberpunk coming. They're, they're, they're fed. I cannot wait for that. Uh, that is one of the very, very rare exceptions where I will be purchasing a game on day one and making time to play it. Same. Maybe we could. Well, no, that wouldn't work. I was going to say maybe we could kind of play it together. It. That would be fun. And I'm also kind of getting into PS4, so we could kind of do, we could do that too. We could do, because they have the um, share play. Which works pretty well too. Yeah, I would be willing to do it that way Although, too. Although, if anyone's listening to this, I will say, Jason has Google Fiber, like ridiculous internet speed at this point. And while well, mine's not Google Fiber, I have really good internet where I live. Um, so, your mileage may vary. Sure, yeah. I never, I've never tried it on slow internet, so I don't know. Um, okay, that's enough of that. Let's get into our bonus segment, which will also probably be our final segment for today. Uh, let's talk about the thing you're most well known for <laughs> as a gamer. Uh, as, Diablo, a, as a person. As a person, yes. Let's talk about Diablo 2. And let's give everyone a little bit of background uh, into your obsession with Diablo 2. How did you get into Diablo 2? Let's start there. Give us the year, like everything that was going on. Like, let's talk about it. I uh, am someone with one of the worst memories of anyone you've ever met. I remember almost nothing about my childhood. <laughs> I had a great, I had a great childhood from what I hear, but eh, you know, <laughs> your earliest memory is like when you were eight. <laughs> I, I, my wife, my wife, I, uh, I. I met her in high school. We started dating in high school. And uh, there's times where I'll tell her stories about my quote unquote childhood. And she's like, Greg, I was there. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's so bad. (laughs) Yeah. But one of my, with all of that said, the reason I bring it up is uh, one time I remember we lived in Florida back when I was really young. And uh, our dad came home with a bunch of blank discs that had uh, like writing on them in Sharpie. And one of them was Diablo 2. And this was back in the day when uh, people like disc writers and readers were really expensive. They weren't like readily available. Um, So these games had no encryption on them whatsoever. Um, And one of his, you know, he's a software engineer. So one of his, you know, computer geeky friends owned one and owned a writer. So he literally just took his copy of Diablo 2, copied onto a disc and gave it to dad and said, hey, you guys can go play this. I did not realize that. I'm going to have to fact check you for corrections, but that's insane. <laughs> yeah. So we we couldn't play online because the online aspect that you had to have a, a CD key. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yes. But we popped Diablo 2 in and we could start playing it. And you could play single player. And it was so fun. Um, but that really wasn't what Diablo 2 was about. Playing the game was like the least relevant part of the game um once we bought a real copy of it eventually and could play online um there's this whole market where you know it's an rpg with um very 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 robust items and customization um and and things that are remarkably rare i mean literally you could play the game uh, your entire life and you would never find every item in the game that that's the kind of game it is there are youtubers to this day who stream it trying to hunt for a perfect item it's it's ridiculous but with that said to build characters there was a robust trading market so what i got into and what diablo 2 playing meant to me was uh trading for digital fake diablo currency and building up like an empire and i did you ever get into this aspect of it jason no only kind of as a bystander to what you were doing because you and kane and josh like far surpassed what i was able to even keep track of in my head with like diablo knowledge and and i like i never really got on the d2jsp or anything like that so for everyone who doesn't know um, what Greg's talking about, you are talking about D2JSP, right? Yes. That was an external forum that was not sanctioned or associated with Blizzard at all. And they would make up, they had this fake currency called Forum Gold, and you would trade 
for forum gold outside of the game and then go into the game, meet up with the person, and then trade the actual items. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah, I mean that that's a yeah, FG form gold, we call it FG. So it was this fake currency and it was such a sketchy market because uh there was no guarantee that the person you were trading this form gold with would actually give you the item or vice versa and it was a big system based on trust and reputation. And I played this uh, played this trading market um for years and years and years and this was a time in life where unlike now you had infinite time to play video games. Especially I mean, in the summer. 60, 70 hour weeks, treated it like a full-time job. <laughs> I remember lot- mom and dad would have to be like, Greg, you have to stop playing for long enough to eat. Like, <laughs> Yeah, so absolutely as into this as you could be into anything. And, you know, being like 11 year old, 11 year old at the time or whatever, and trading with like adults and, and interacting with people. And like, you know, it it really taught me uh, a lot. It kind of, I don't know. I feel like a lot of what I became came from uh, dealing with these people in this way. Wheeling and dealing. So speaking of wheeling and dealing. So what was the, so you were kind of famous for make actually making real life money on this game. Talk to us about some of the series of trades that you would do. Like you had this one guy I know that you would do, you would find the same things for him and then you would sell them as a package or like, I know there are other things. Like what was the scheme? Like what was your strategy for making, making well FGN real money? So by the end of my time with this game, I was like one of the top, very small handful of quote unquote richest people in the game. Like my username on that, that site still holds uh reputation dragon slayer 37. If there's any, Does uh, it really? Re- yeah. I like, thought you that, were going to say money. No, that was my in game account. Dragon slayer okay. 37. That like still okay. meant something on that website for as long as it lasted. Wow. Like a, a, so, a like a well off person would have like a thousand FG and I had a hundred thousand. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you're the one percent yeah i was the one percent i was the king of the castle i conquered so, it how did you do it so 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 okay so i got in with a guy who uh was like i guess a hacker and he could or something like i don't know how he had the ability to do this because this was like when the game was well patched and everything anyways he could duplicate items um and his ability to do that and make these fake items meant that uh we had uh, basically in an infinite inventory because there was a way to perm these items right which means to make them permanent in the game so they didn't disappear yeah, sometimes yes sometimes no like so the jewels were like a regular shop i would run that would upgrade your items in certain ways and people would pay really really high dollar for these because they're very very specific and the people who are still playing this game 15 years after it released were the people right. who were trying to make things perfect and, yeah, to, you know, and to put that in perspective for everybody when greg was talking about the ripped discs that we got that was literally like in 2001 less than a year after the game came out when he was making his money and everything that was like in 2000 9 2010 so that would have been like seven well, they, or eight years after the game came out yeah i mean the end of that run when i finally quit was like 2012 2013 yeah so we're talking way 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 like this game has matured the the user base that the the, the casual user base had come and gone these were really the people who were just super into this game who probably oh. still play this game <laughs> and i wish i still could But yeah, so we would run this shop and we would sell regularly. And like when the ladder reset, which is like when uh, everybody's characters would default to non-ladder and all new characters would start where nobody has anything. Literally everybody starting at level one all over again. And there's a giant rush to level 99. Um, This guy had the ability to get stuff like way ahead of time that you definitely shouldn't have that early. I still to this day, have no idea how he did it. And I would be the market. Like I'd basically be the salesman to push all of this out. And I kept a cut of everything. Um, That was how I really blew up. But that was like, I spent years though, just trying to trade and get up to a level where it's like, you trade one thing for something slightly better and like, you know, really, really going after it. And it was uh, amazing. And eventually, though, had to come to an end. So what? why did you stop? So in high school, there was a trip I wanted to go on that was particularly expensive. So I wrestled in high school. 
and I wanted to go to the biggest national tournament because like if I wanted to get like a college scholarship or something, I had to get up there and I had to go do good. Which is and Fargo, I was like, right? Yeah, Fargo. I was like, it's time to cash out. And I people would pay cash for FG, which was super, super sketchy because keep in mind, there's not a way to keep track of trading for items. So there's even right. less of a way to keep track of trading for money. It's and not the, like Bitcoin. There's no like block. Accountability. Cha- yeah, there's like... <laughs> So the first time I did it, I was supposed to sell something for like three or four hundred dollars, and the guy just straight up scammed me. Mm, how did like, he scam you? So it was <laughs> so it was like I had a block of items, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna give you half the items. You're gonna pay me all the money, then I'll give you the other half the items. Seems fair, right? It's like, yeah. Gave him half the items, he just left. <laughs> <laughs> it was two hundred dollars oh, worth of stuff. Oh, dude! And he just left, and I was like, "And there's nothing you, there's no recourse because this is no not recourse. sanctioned. There's nothing you this can do is about the it. wild, wild west." And I was okay, and that was like a sizable chunk of the stuff I had, and I was like, "Okay, this isn't gonna work like this." And then I was kind of like, "I need this money, and I can't just risk keep handing things out and people running away." So, yeah. <laughs> What do I do here? So I was like, okay, I'm the one with the reputation on this site. Like I'm the one with a hundred thousand FG. You're paying me first period for doing this. You're paying me first. And, uh, people would. So Jason, you probably remember this. <laughs> remember I had, you had to drive down to Walgreens and go, yes. to, go to the Western union. <laughs> so sketchy. You had to give these people your real name. <laughs> like and people, and people wired us a, a significant sums of money yeah. over Western Union. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because like took hours, by the way. Right. Yeah, so you're so commuting. Why didn't we do PayPal or something? Because I think, I don't think they had the friends and family thing. I think they were taking cuts from PayPal. But Welfare or uh, Western Union's not cheap. Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. I really can't believe looking back on this and at the age I was, I was like 14 at the time of this happening or whatever. Like, it's really, who was letting us do this? Like, how are my mom and dad okay with people <laughs> wiring us money? I don't think we asked. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, so, yeah, by the time I cashed out, I made, like, my final big sale at the very end of it was, like, a $1,500 was able to pay for my trip with it. And I, I still had a lot left over because I told myself that, like, I would come back one day didn't happen because then Mm. you know you go to college and you real life happens and every now and then i still get the itch where i'm like oh man oh man if i could have like a you know perf nigma like a 775 (laughs) oh man none of this means oh and put it in the bp so it looks cool get all your gcs to match up like oh i still twitch about it can't can't go but you know one time it was like in college, I was like, I'll log back in. I bet my account still logs in. And I logged in and I was like, oh man, I could do this. I'm, I got, oh, I'll find time. And I went on to D2JSP and I went on to the uh, Eastern uh, Trading non ladder and, you know, clicked on and it was uh, seven active users. Oh my gosh. Wow. I was like crushed. I was like, this, this isn't the thing anymore. This is so actually D- over now. D2JSP is just dead now. Yeah, when Diablo 3 came out, they tried D3JSP, but at that point, Blizzard was like, yeah, this is a thing people do, so they built it into the game. Yeah, and that kind of ruined it a little bit, oddly. Yeah, well, because uh, this game was really the core of actually playing the game for the people who actually wanted to play Diablo. Like, I didn't kill any monsters the last, like, seven years I played the game. (laughs) Like, you you just don't do that anymore. It was just a a freaking fake stock market. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, Diablo three, they built it in be, to service the people like me who wanted to play it like that. The problem was, uh, for the casual fan, it was no longer about killing monsters to find loot. It was just about trading. And really the game was supposed to be about killing monster and finding loot. So when they actually built it into Diablo three, in a lot of ways, a lot of people felt like it ruined the franchise. Which I see, I don't know. I just don't think their implementation of that aspect was was fun. I mean, because they had it like a, just an auction thing where you just put it out there and then people would bid on it. The, the it's the it's the wheeling, the dealing, the haggling. The that's what always was 
what that game was about to me as someone who didn't do the DTJSP thing. But like, I really loved just creating a game and being like, Oh, I'm looking for a Shaco. And then like <laughs> people would come into the game and be like, Oh, you want this one? And they would of course try to scam you by switching it out for a oh, different, God. you know, helmet that looked the, the same or whatever. Group of people. Yeah. But it was the fun part of like, like you said, just trading your way up and you just get something that's a little better and a little better and a little better. You can't do that on the auction thing. You just put it out there and then it's yeah, gold. It's, it's no interaction. It's it's efficient because what we used to do, like you said, you would title like a room like trading and then people would come in and they would just throw all their items out in the box and you could hold your hand over and look at them. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's funny because it's like, I mean, you know, there's no guarantee anyone's going to have anything worthwhile and you're sitting there real time typing like yeah. it's uh it's, but that was the fun part of it to me. No, it was awful, but it was amazing. Like that was before JSP like trading like that, there was a years long stretch where that was the thing. Um and that was that was really really fun. And I I honestly believe that like those interactions with those people in those ways uh really developed me through some developmental years where like i don't know and to some extent i learned to deal with people yeah learn not to trust anybody who plays video games right (laughs) they will teach you some hard lessons i want to i don't i mean we are like going on two and a half hours here so i don't want to talk much more like you you might have to edit this down some but yeah we'll cut it um, down but like i do want to talk about like the scams that people would pull. My, how about the of, time we scam? Okay, how about the time we scammed the guy who was like fresh out of prison? Oh, I felt bad about that, but at the same time, I kind of don't. I, <laughs> I don't even remember how we scammed him. I just remember we just didn't pay him. Yeah, that's just stealing. So, okay. that's, that's not just scamming. That's just that's not scamming. Stealing. Just stealing. No, so, I want the the cle- Go ahead. Okay, so this guy, we were talking with him. This was on the JSP time. And we were talking with him. And he was talking about he just got out of prison. And he was like, he was lying through. to us, though. Hey, you know what? He probably was because he was probably trying to scam us, too. Yeah. But but he was talking about all this stuff. We were talking. And we finally, like, cut a deal. And we met up in the game. And, uh, and he gave us the item. And we just left, which... <laughs> It's so terrible looking yeah. back. At no, the time, that, it was hilarious. That's not a scam. That's just stealing, that's man. That's just stealing. Wow. Oh, we I, <laughs> I appreciate the real hustle uh, of the, the D&D scam. That was the good oh one. Oh, my God. So the, this scam, the way that it worked is everything was chat-based and text-based. So you were at your computer typing. And what people would say to do is that they knew a special way to like duplicate items. And so they would tell you to do forward slash D and D and then your account name and then some other mumbo jumbo and then your password. And if you did this there, it would, it would, you would, you would, you would have to say in there like forward slash D and D your account name, the item that you want and then like some other random stuff and then your password in parentheses and blah, 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 blah. blah. So they had this whole elaborate thing that they, they took you through of how to do it and where to go in the game and where to stand and, it, and what you had to have in your inventory. And it seemed very, very real. And at the time, not a lot of people could duplicate items. So you didn't know what was real and what was not real and why <laughs> this would work and why it wouldn't work. But um, when you did that, then actually just put up your do not disturb message. So when people would private message you, it would show them your do not disturb message and you've just given them your account name, your password. Oh my God. Um, and then they would just log into your account and steal your stuff. We, we definitely fell for that one. The other one was the, if you were Alt duplicating F4. an item, Alt F4. Yeah. You <sighs> duplicate an item. One person stands inside of town. One person stands outside of town. So they can't get to your stuff, quote unquote. And then you type in this random thing that you got to type in that special code. And then you press Alt and F4, which just closes you out of the whole game and your inventory stuck in the game. And then they just, and then just walk in, pick it, up. pick it up and leave. Yep. Oh, um, here was the, here was the, here was another classic. Here's another classic one. There were certain items and this is how like old and broken this game was that you couldn't show in the, um, you, you couldn't show it in the trade screen. Like it would not let right. you pick it up. So you had to drop it on the floor. So I dropped my stuff on the floor and you drop your stuff on the floor. And then we, on the other side of a wall, and then we both walk around the wall at like an even pace and I get yep. my stuff and you get your stuff. Like it was the only way to trade these items. And uh, so one of the classic scams was you put a bunch of stuff on your character to where you walk twice as fast as normal. 
Oh. And so you could walk around the wall, get their stuff, and get back to pick your stuff what? back up before they could get around the wall. See, I didn't know about that. I knew about the town telly. Oh, yeah. That was another one. You so could teleport were, in town and steal people's stuff. Yeah, if you were a sorceress, so you can't use magic inside of town, but you can use magic outside of town. So if you're a sorceress, you can teleport. So what you could do is you would you would go outside of town and you would have them stay inside of town. Then you would do the same thing Greg was just talking about, where you were supposed to walk around the wall to get to each other's thing, and that's how you would trade. Well, if you were a source, you could wait till they were about halfway and you were about halfway, teleport back to your stuff, pick it up, teleport into town, pick up their stuff, and then just leave the game. Yeah. So. It was uh, it was the wild, wild west, yeah. and this was also early internet days, right? So like, there weren't these like, like there wasn't like the gaming reporting like it is now. People didn't talk about games the same way, and if it, they did, it, we didn't know about it. And if we did, yeah, we sure didn't know about it. So discovering all of this and finding it out wasn't like we were googling it and looking this stuff up. Nobody did. It yeah. was like either you were a veteran who played the game and had you you had gotten screwed over by somebody. In which case you knew what the, the you know, the scam was. Right. Or, or you didn't and you got scammed. And uh, <laughs> it was really the wild, wild west. It this, was a very toxic culture. <laughs> it was awful. At the time, I didn't realize it. Looking back now, it's kind of like, huh. But yeah. something like this just could never exist again because yeah. now people would look everything up and everything yeah. is a Google search away. It just yeah. wasn't like that back then. Oh, and not to mention there's like no consideration given to that by Blizzard. And so like they left in things that allowed you to do that. They didn't patch them out. And and you could like, for instance, if you just wanted to be a jerk, you could go into any game. If you were level 99, you would go into a game with people who are level one. Go hostile. Kill them. Yeah, you could go hostile against them, even if they weren't hostile against you. And you could just kill them and you could follow them around and kill them the whole night if you wanted to. And there's nothing they could do about it. And, and there's nothing and anyone could do about it. E- even worse, you could do this in hardcore mode where if you die once, your character's deleted. Yeah. So, so I could walk into a hardcore game of someone who has spent 70 hours building their character, click hostile, walk outside, kill them, and their character's gone forever. Oh, my gosh. The good old days. I, I mean, you, it's it's weird because, like, through this 2020 lens, uh, this, you know, if you look at this through a 2020 lens, you're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. People were just People jerks. be throwing a fit. There's no anti-griefing or, like, no. Griefing was part of it, and it was the part of the culture, and we just loved it and did it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so the thing is, like, I have really fond memories of it, even as much as we got screwed over. It was just, like, got, okay. learning we got, we got life's hard lessons. So much more than we came out on top. Oh, for sure, for sure. But Until the end. Until the end. I mean, I, I eventually uh, had a good run, but there was, a, a, like, a decade of, of getting my butt kicked. Yeah, well, you know, you got to pay your dues. So, oh. well, hey, that is a very, very long episode. So, I think what's let's wrap it up there um greg gets another week off of being the worst because he actually added corrections music and he's guest hosting hosting so we do appreciate Boom. you for filling in uh it sounds like you might edit this episode too so that that's cool yeah we're gonna cut <laughs> this down to under two hours so well good luck man there's a lot of good content i don't i don't want to lose any of the good stuff but i'll, yeah, I'll definitely you- take out the part where you left for 10 minutes to take a poop well, can you, if, if any of your fill time stuff was funny, can you lead it? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. All right. Well, that's it, everybody. So find us at uh, neverfreetoplay.com or on Patreon at patreon.com slash neverfreetoplay. I uh, hope you guys have a fantastic week. We will try, but we are never free to play. Yeah.